to my channel. My name is Lisa Alistway, and on this channel, you will find a variety of inspirational and informational videos. So if that sounds good to you and you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. My guest today is Dr. John T. Churbon, who is a lecturer in psychology at Harvard Medical School and has taught courses on relationships, sexuality, and spirituality for more than 30 years. Dr. Churbon is also the author of Collateral Damage, Guiding and Protecting Your Child Through the Minefield of Divorce. I will be linking his website down below for your reference. Welcome, Dr. Charbon. Pleasure to be with you, Lisa. Yes. So do you have anything you'd like to add to your background in that introduction? Oh, I think we're good. I think we're very fine to, to start uh, speaking on the subject for today, which is the dirty dozen. Okay, so I'm... <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. So today, I really want to provide our audience with some informational and inspirational uh, tools regarding co-parenting. Um, as everybody knows, one in two marriages ends in divorce, and a lot of children are going to experience their parents' divorce. And then it gets becomes more complicated if you're on a second marriage and you've got step-siblings and step brothers and half brothers and stepmothers and stepfathers and then the divorce rate goes up even higher for second marriages I believe around 70 percent so there's a lot of people um, I'm hoping that this information today will be really useful you have identified 12 um, areas where parents are going to be needing a little help with their co-parenting and not making these 12 mistakes and then um, so we're going to talk about those and then maybe provide a little bit of advice to do instead and just be real conscious of your co-parenting. Sounds very good. Okay. Yes. So the first one that you've identified as a mistake that uh, co-parents make uh, post-divorce is uh, they put their kids in the middle. Can you talk a little bit on that? Yes, I think, well, just in terms of just this dirty dozen, these, it, it is so difficult. I think we want to start out with empathizing for, with the parents. I mean, a divorce is a, is a death in many ways. It's a, it's a very damaging process. And one is both emotionally and physically overwhelmed. And I think when I make that reference to death, I think just as in death, many times parents aren't clear about the impact of the, the, a death in the family in working with the child. So they tend to somewhat gloss over it and they're enveloped in their own emotions and their own distress. And although they care a great deal about the child uh, or the children, uh, in, it's not unusual for these dirty dozen, and that's why I identify them as such, occur. Now this, this data is coming from a study of over 10,000 children and parents of divorce. And it was based on a survey that was done for the book Collateral Damage. And the material there uh, demonstrates really the acute pain that children suffer. Um, parents know that there's difficulty and clearly there's uh, in, in the courts often a reference to wanting to do what is in the best interest of the child. So we are working for the best interest of the child, but often the dirty dozen, which we're going to op open up and kind of unfold in a moment here, um, demonstrates how um, missed the basic boulders are that occur for kids who are not necessarily speaking out, but enduring the direct and indirect uh, warfare that occurs even in seemingly amicable so-called divorce, that there are so many levels of communication that are missed. So as you said, um, putting the kids in the middle, how does that occur, the first one? Well, parents don't necessarily want to put the children in the middle, but there can be these conscious and unconscious movements to do so, which means um, there can be direct acts of persuasion, which is like, let me tell you what's going on, you know, and you're actually getting the child to be in an advocacy position or wanting to persuade them with your perspective, not sensitive to the fact that your child is a product of both a mom and a dad, and that those foundations are critical for the child's stability and own security. 
So there may be some terrible things that are occurring, but essentially that's still your mom, that's still your dad. And walking that is a very challenging subject for most parents because of the emotionality that they're going through. And uh, children are often brought to take sides and they're brought to do this even in courts. And parents can, again, both directly and indirectly nurture that. Uh, and sometimes, again, as I say, it's conscious and unconscious. And of course, there would be a conscious motive because, you know, it, when we're in a relationship, we can often card stack all the great things about a relationship and see it all as wonderful and the best thing that ever occurred. But when we're not in a positive relationship or maybe a negative critical relationship, we could similarly card stack all the damaging material. And that kind of teeter-totter is what occurs uh, in that persuasive element of putting the children in the middle. Most definitely. And so what advice would you give somebody then to not to always keep it at the forefront, not to put the children in the middle? What would you say well, I think to it's a parents question. to keep I, that I, at the I, forefront? I think, I think it's great that maybe we give some time in each instance of one of these, let's say, damaging elements to kind of move mm -hmm. toward how to counter it and how to manage it. First of all, is to recognize that this is a very uh, traumatic experience for the child. I mean, not be, it may not be felt that way, but the child is often looking for support. Actually, most kids just want to play or they're in their own worlds of what we see as a normal egocentrism, but the, they are often shifted out of it in the face of trauma or in the, in this, in the case of these uh, chaotic situations. And now they're brought into it. They're brought into this area. And they are the ones often in what we say a parentified role where the child is trying to take care to try to settle things for the parents. And it's almost a role reversal. So the, the parent, is, of course, is the one who's supposed to be guiding and helping the child and caring. And the child, in spite of limited resources, may want to soothe and again, calm the energy of the parent. That says nothing about the child's needs. So what, what do we need to do here? I think, first of all, is to recognize uh, maybe the, ne the necessity of, of therapy and support and having some kind of objective guidance for the person who's going through that. And also recognize the usefulness of that for the child, that they don't need just the parent. They do need the parent to support. They need both parents ideally to support and to help with to care, mm -hmm. but they also may need their space to try to sort out what's transpiring because the, the real question is who is really there for the child when the basic supports are divided and may be at war. So then the child maybe goes to both. And oftentimes you get this almost kind of schizoid dynamic where the child says one thing to one parent and the other to the other, and maybe even report language that is almost contradictory in order to try to balance this uh, seemingly unmanageable situation. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point about like not having the role reversal where the child starts acting like the parent and the parents needing all the comforting and soothing during the divorce. They might want to find a different outlet, like a friend to talk to, not their child to talk to. The child's not the therapist, um, is not the adult friend, doesn't know adult situations. So be real conscious of not putting that role on the child. Yeah, exactly, and there's a real temptation for that. So I think the way you said that is quite fine and, and, and accurate, that the parent doesn't necessarily want to do yes. that, but uh, there is something beautiful about a caring child, and that is invariably sure. welcome to the parent, but the, putting the child, as you said, in that role is unfair. Mm -hmm. it, absolutely. Um, so number two is, using kids to fight battles that's another huge huge mistake and this and this can occur both directly and indirectly as again it's in the intensity of one that number two evolves which is a much more direct action of course that's extremely painful and the again the emotionality that can be felt by one parent can tap into that which is like it's another way of getting back or maybe uh, creating some distress for someone who, with whom you're angry, but nothing often could be more potent than your child coming at you. I mean, your, that is, your child is the one who you're wanting to be the best, and now that turned against you is often the most painful uh, experience for someone, and a very potent 
um, let's say, a very potent uh, uh, weapon that can be used by parents so that getting the child to, you know, tell your father how angry you are or something like that, uh, as opposed, you know, so you were earlier going to, you know, what is the, the opposite end of that is to, and I think it is walking a sensitive line and it's not quite walking a tightrope, but it is <clears throat> because the, the home is changed. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in the divorce survey, many of the kids said quite directly, uh, my family ended. Uh, what a horror story for a child. My family ended. That's like, your resources, all of your supplies, all of your 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 base, is, it shouldn't be ended. It is being reorganized. It is being redirected. And clearly that may take various shapes and forms, but you're not wanting to put the child, so you're wanting the child to be able to express himself or express herself, but you're not wanting. So even if it is anger, you want to be able to rather than direct the child to go directly at the other parent to be able to, to try to create it as a conversational matter. You, you have some negative feelings. I am sometimes having negative feelings too. Again, don't go into the content of that, but it, it's important and encourage the child to express those feelings, but in a conversational manner. It's important for you to speak to your mom. It's important for you to speak to your dad and to express what you're feeling and to try to bring it to what we would probably say is a rational communicative level as opposed to emotionality, which is just acting out. It's not to say that there might not be that. And hopefully parents can embrace that and understand that, but you really want to get it to the communication and to the constructive expression. Yes, yes. And sometimes when there are divorces and it's contentious and you don't like each other and you're fighting over money and fighting over custody, mm -hmm. the best thing you can do is not weaponize your child. Your child is not a weapon to be used for your battles. You right. need to fight your own battles and not use your child and keep that in mind because it's so damaging that anger that you are projecting to your ex spouse. You're going, your, your child's going to absorb a lot of that aggression and a lot of that anger. And you have to like- And, and something you just said, Lisa- be Very, very uh, mindful. I, I like what you said because you said you need to fight your battles. And I think there uh, you can get a, an alliance with your child that when you, you the child feels that you're e expressing those battles in the house or starting to verbalize some of these things which we're moving in on as damaging, to let your child know, you can nudge me and tell me like, oh, you're getting, you know, mom, you're getting a little too upset, you're dead, you're really, you know, doing something that makes me uncomfortable. So that can occur and quite normally might occur. I mean, uh, in terms of, again, the study, there were divorces that occurred where the children didn't even know what happened because the parents were almost so sterile and almost antiseptic and clinical about the divorce. The kids didn't, you know, it's like, we're here today and then now we're, we're not a family anymore. We, we heard there's a divorce. It's almost like strikingly rational, strikingly. Th that's not what we're looking for here. Uh, so dealing with our right. emotions and our person is, is normal, but bringing that to a, a subject of conversation and addressing it and processing it and communicating about it is the healthy thing you want to do. And also maybe there, you know, just like if, uh, you know, you're, let's say using language that's not appropriate, like inviting your child to bring that to your attention because you may not be conscious. Yes, very good. Um, so number three, let's move on to treating sure. kids as property is another huge red flag mistake you need to avoid. Um, can you talk about what that means and how that looks? Correct. I, you know, I think this does go into the uh, the arsenal of warfare. Uh, sometimes that plays out in divorce, and it plays out as both property. I mean, it's gen generally attorneys will tell us that it's about money and kids. That's those are the two issues. So um, the, the issue is how to um, maybe create a strategy that is in your interest, this is the parent, uh, concerning money and kids. And sometimes that is treating the child as property, which is, um, it, it can be toward an end of uh, financial purpose or maybe emotional or power purpose. And all of that is treating the child. It's, it's really uh, making the child not a person, not someone with feelings and needs. And clearly the needs are for both parents. Um, but 
really approaching it as if you are in control and it is a power matter. And then we go back to what we referenced earlier in the conversation about uh, the, the court standard of actions and decisions of the court based on the in the best interest of the children. So it's often formulated. So everyone speaks in that way. Mm -hmm. And then basically we're saying nothing <laughs> so, because we're all saying in the best interest of the children, but it's like, we need to do, we need to in, in, in embrace and e express actions that are in the best interest of the children. And that is where that conversational element and emotional element needs to take place. Most definitely. And if, when I hear this, like treating people as property, it's almost like you own them. It's like ownership. Like it's, it's, it's an object rather than you're actually dealing with an individual with their sovereign needs, their feelings and taking care of those during this difficult process rather than just, you know, treating that child as an object. So real important to take note of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, oh, this is a really good no, no. And that is revealing legal details. Yes. I, I think just, the word divorce, which of course has a legal element and little kids in elementary school, primary grades, first and second grade, as I've learned, uh, know the word divorce. And it is like cancer for many of them, you know, depending on their experience. I mean, clearly in situations where it seems like the house is on fire and there's a crazy uh, abusive parent, maybe that would be welcome for a, ch a child in his own mind. You know, it's like, how do we stop this? But that's usually not the case. So the point here is recognizing that just that word has yeah. incredible reverberations for kids. And then other words like custody, or parenting time, and that's legal information. And then, of course, the child wants to know, and I'm not one who would advocate that you shouldn't communicate. Again, that's the conversational element, but that's not about legal details, uh, like I'm doing this, or we're going to you know, have a motion to do that. Uh, you know, That's em embroiling and escalating the anxiety. And again, you're, you have the child in direct warfare, and you don't want to do that. You actually want to do the opposite, which is basically there are difficulties. Our primary interest is to keep you stable and happy and secure. And we're here, both of us are here to make that happen in the best way we can. So that's the ultimate message you want to deliver. And you do need to kind of appropriately, and it is an age appropriate matter, address the, these other yes. subjects. So for that primary school kid, they don't need to know about legal matters. It might be quite different in terms of articulation with a high school kid because you know they are more articulate they have what we would speak about as formal operations they have a, a, a more complex understanding of relationships and behavior and you don't need to you know keep them completely isolated you, and it, and that's where in uh, collateral damage we speak about the different ways of communicating uh, to, to in an age appropriate manner most definitely um yeah because again the divorce can be very contentious and children don't need to know every detail about what's in that legal document and that contract mm -hmm. um like you said keep it age appropriate developmentally appropriate and kind of as a need to know basis they don't need all the details the dirty details of fighting paying lawyers all the different things on the back and they don't need to know that and, and I think that here we're highlighting the importance of keeping the child's world as positive, stable, healthy, supported, and you know happy as possible. And you can do, you know, as a parent in this process, your best. You can't necessarily um, direct the other person. Clearly, that would be a problem um, to you know your your partner, your former spouse, to do their part. But you could you could act appropriately, and that will be deeply uh, appreciated by the child. Yes, yes, very good. Okay, number five is disclosing secrets about your spouse. So that is um, a, a very um, overwhelmingly 
a damaging element, kind of an outgrowth of that legal stuff that occurs. So again, in that card stacking element of trying to explain why this is not a workable situation, this marriage, there's an effort to indeed to card stack all the negative stuff. And children being exposed to details of what we would call adult behavior or adult secrets or adult communication or really things that really probably came out of a connected part of the relationship would be um, so damaging for a child because generally parents are trying to guide a child in a road of what's good and what's right and healthy and virtuous and going to build character and strength and uh, confidence. And this material is the, the actual poison to undo them. Because if they recognize that their parents are bad, um, then maybe I'm bad. And that, you know, they're in a, they're, their identity and our identity formation is in process in a very fragile manner. And bringing them into that um, chaos can be so uh, emotionally confusing for them that those roads of opportunity to become some kind of, I don't know, professional doctor, lawyer, whatever, you know, business person, whatever their fantasy is, uh, artist, whatever their, their goal is, has not, now gets kind of um, colored by this sense of I'm no good or my world is no good and that darkness um, emerges. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. And I know some secrets, they just, they come uncovered, you know, not all secrets can stay a secret. And I know, again, age appropriate, uh, if one of the spouses had an affair, and that might not be something you want to share, maybe wait till they're an adult. Right. Um, however, if there is another baby and another family, and there's mm -hmm. secrets that obviously are going to come forward, but I, I think it's really important that, again, the communication and age development appropriate right. conversations. And, and, you know, your comments always invite a, a response, it seems to me, that um, you know, the issue, let's say that, let's call it the, the foibles, the, the errors, maybe the mistakes of a parent, you know, that can be actually guided or directed in a constructive way because we're all human, we're all in process. So your child needs to know that about himself or herself as well. So mom can make a mistake, dad can make a mistake, but it doesn't mean they're bad, you know. Um, I can make a mistake as a kid, I am not bad. I made a mistake, I need to fix that. So I mean, having it as a constructive, you, you we can always constructively and positively respond to material. But the issue is in this mm -hmm. dark cloud, there's a tendency to not want to, you know, there's a tendency to miss it. And that's why we talk about it as the dirty dozen. Very good. Okay, number six is splitting occurs in two forms. What do you mean by that? So um, I think the, the splitting is, of course, um, mom is doing it this way, dad is doing it that way. And it occurs on um, the, I mean, generally parents and good parenting behavior, even if the mom or dad agrees with the other, are generally directed to kind of address that privately with the other person, not in the face of the child, because that causes confusion and invites splitting. So the splitting is, well, I'll go to mom to do this and I'll go to dad to do that. And uh, certainly, you know, adolescents quite commonly, at least I find in my practice, learn how to milk that you know, extraordinarily, but it doesn't help them. So they get what they want by splitting because the parents are split. So now we get two directives. Well, mom does it this way. I get, you know, and then parents can also get into the good cop, bad cop syndrome where let's say one of them has only visitation. So the power move there could easily be, and it might be quite uh, an expression of emotional pain as well. Um, enveloping the child with gifts and goodies and, you know, not being the disciplinarian and the one who is kind of managing the, the fort and kind of overseeing the, the marital home is often uh, left with uh, all those responsibilities and becomes the disciplinarian. So you, you want to be, again, conscious of that, of that and, and want to even articulate uh, the, that dynamic with the child 
so that they can be conscious of what they're doing. Because even if there are some, let's say for adolescents, some benefits, well, dad's gonna say, dad said I can stay out till two, you know, <laughs> or something like that. And there are privileges there. Um, you want to bring to the table with the child and ideally to communicate uh, if possible with the other parent that this will not be in the ultimate interest of the child. So, you know, it really goes back now to importation and discussion of parenting styles. What are healthy parenting styles? And we usually say firm and loving generally, you know, just love your children always. And that that's the basic message, but firm guidance and direction is essential. So we speak about, you know, uh, you know, authoritative styles, authoritarian styles, laissez-faire styles, and all of these have implications. There's, there are, and then there are parents who are absolutely not involved. And those parenting styles have direct correlations and impact on child development. Yes, I, I would hope that most parents before they even have a child, they're on the same page about how they're going to parent their child when they come into this world. And as you pointed out, the authoritative parenting is the ideal type of parenting. Because mm -hmm. um, like you said, you don't want to have like the Disneyland dad that's always saying yes to everything. And then so the mom has to set boundaries and disciplines. And so like you said, the bad cop and Hopefully you guys, even if you're divorced, you can still be co-parenting with the same values. And again, Lisa, every time you speak, I feel like I want to chime in um, because I think the uh, yeah. part here is to embrace the range of the emotionality of the child. There, there is a shakeup, a trauma, a pain. So that in, in definitely invites um, sadness, anger, hurt, you want to be able to have a place for that to be both expressed and addressed and processed, both in the home as well as maybe professionally. But you also want to have the other side, which is the primary task of supporting that solid foundation for healthy growth. That will always remain divorced family or not. And it is a, re it is a, it is a responsibility of the parents. Most definitely. Very good. All right. Number seven is simply guilting. What do you mean by guilting? Well, I think this is really um, where a child feels guilt and can be made to feel guilt. Like it's not, it was very interesting uh, as I read those, the surveys of very young kids that they literally said, I did this and I caused the divorce. I didn't pick up my room or something like that. So they, a child yeah. just like in the face of death may feel like, and it's not unusual for adults to feel like this uh, in the face of a, adult behavior, someone dies and there's a sense of, I didn't do enough, I didn't care enough. I, you know. So the guilting is this often experience of the loss and the management and the pain of wanting to well, it's, it's a way of expressing the sense that I may have addressed, caused this or produced this. And then the other side of the, the guilting is literally direct where you can have a child um, feel that they are the problem. And parents in their anger and in their overwhelmed experiences can do and say things um, which make that child feel responsible. And that's, those are those cues that you really want to sensitively watch. So uh, let's say for a single parent uh, who doesn't have much of an income, it might require a second job or more support and the child might see that. So the child may, you, you want to be open and honest about the facts. Yeah, this is going on, but you also want to make that a, con a conversational constructive communication, but we're in this together, you know, the, and I'm here to do my best, but you don't want to make them feel like your toil and your stress is because of them. So this is the kind of thing we're trying to address there. And it can be done often with the um, parents in their own frustration. And that's why I think I speak about the necessity of therapy in the process of divorce, because I see divorce as generally a, uh, well, certainly one of the most um, the most stressful, distressful experiences of life. Yes. So that's really interesting that you point out how the child can take on the guilt um, irrationally because it's not their fault, or they could be projected on uh, because of the parent's guilt, um, because it's the parent's failure in the divorce. Um, 
I've seen in my own observation with parent guilt after a divorce, they will try to buy their child's love and they will pay for expensive vacations or expensive gifts to make up for the guilt that they're feeling as the parent. Well, I think that's an excellent point and of course, very relevant. And there may be a tendency to do that. And you know, to do so self-consciously is different than to do so unconsciously. Like to say, you know, this has been a rough one. You know, it's like, you know, I don't know, you had a rough exam. I'm now shifting out of the divorce story, but let's say that your child went through, let's say a rough finals exam period or something, you know, that, that you do something special, you know, but that is to do so consciously versus to do this more insidious thing, which you're referencing. And I think that bleeds into the next um, yeah. element of that we're going to be addressing. Yeah, yeah. Watch out for the guilt spoiling because you know that obviously has some ramifications. All right, so number eight is suffocating is the result of being overly involved in your child's life and monitoring them beyond appropriate boundaries. So suffocating. Yeah. So Lisa, that's what I meant by the bleeding. You can see how that guilting and the behavior you were describing can really produce this, I don't know, maybe this uh, anxiety of the parent. And it can be coming from all kinds of places. And so these things are not simplistic and just driven by one motivation or one level. Um, that suffocating can occur because the parent is replacing an intimacy. And that intimacy interest is now unconsciously directed toward the child. So it's like the way you would care for your lover, you're caring for your kid, um, something like that. And that's like uh, annoying or stressful or putting a burden on the child. And, and Incestuous. Uh, it, 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 yeah, it is. Very well said. Very well said. Yeah. And, and then the, the, the child feels like adult, it's again, parentification coming through the window again. So the the, the child now is again feeling, I got to take care of mom. I have to keep taking care of dad because if I don't, uh, they're in pain and the, the, the suffocating might be filling their schedule. Uh, it might be doing what you said earlier of like too many toys or too much stuff, uh, but not giving them space. And I think it's one of the probably larger problems of our culture where kids are already uh, inundated through electronics, which suffocates them in my mind uh, because they're constantly being engaged as opposed to having some unplugging, exploration, free, uh, you know, time to, you know, discover life or another frequency mm -hmm. being. Yeah, no, most definitely. This reminds me of the term helicopter parenting. Oh, yes. We're always hovering. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You know, 24 seven. I mean, now on the phones, you can GPS your teenager 24 seven. And so they never have any freedom or privacy to themselves. Yeah. And those are those are tough, tough topics and, and very important ones. But um, clearly, you know, trying to recognize the space, the needs and really trying to become aware of what are the developmental needs. I mean, many times parents in intact families don't really zero in on what are the, let's say, the challenges of each age, a stage of growth and development, but really recognizing that your child has hurdles to jump and, and uh, tasks to meet, um, which are not, as you're suggesting about you, they're about your child maybe meeting the world or meeting himself or herself or peer. Yes, yes. So don't displace your, like you said, your loneliness, your friendships. Mm -hmm. uh, your your son is not your boyfriend or create any mm -hmm. of that weird stuff and give them their space and their time, especially teenage years. They absolutely need it. Okay, let's move on to number nine. And that is projecting your agenda onto your child. Correct. So this is the part that occurs, again, in conjunction with a lot of the things we've already said, which is about a decision has been made, maybe you made it, maybe your spouse made it, that this relationship is ending. But then your response uh, emerges, again, consciously and unconsciously, and those feelings and needs and agendas now get directed on this one because it's projected onto the child. So 
my child needs to go to Europe. I don't know. <laughs> my, my child um, uh, doesn't like you. I don't know, whatever. I mean, and then it, it turns into the my child versus the our child. And you see that as a function of that break because in the marital situation, it's we and us and our, but in the separated divided child, often the parent begins to think about self and, it, and that's the possessed, possessed uh, possession issue of that children are possessed as possessions. And this is the projecting of your issues, your dynamics, your needs through the voice and of the child. And that's done through well, various techniques uh, that are not yeah. uh, removed from even like a propagandistic kind of thing. I mean, it's setting up the child and that may again be done consciously and unconsciously. Yeah, and just be real, real careful about resentment. Uh, you don't want to mm -hmm. say things like, you're just like your father or, or start seeing them as their, like their father and all of your resentment and anger is projected onto the child. Well, I think that's a uh, very, uh, that, that comment helps us move into the next one, uh, which you might call and then I can yes. connect with this one. Sure. Would you want to just so that's number it? 10 and that's, yes, number 10 is fighting or attacking your spouse, whether it's in person or even in public. Yes. So here that anger is displayed and the impact on the child is uh, not understood. So even if it's direct, like it's just, I don't want to say you and the other spouse and you're at war, which, which is of course the most painful element the children described in that study that we did. The most painful thing for kids was the fighting of parents. The number one issue of distress was watching or hearing their parents fight. But this issue of fighting and attacking can also play out through extended family, through friends. So the parent often becomes unaware of how negative aspersions to the other parent affects the child. So, well, you know how his dad is. Oh, he's, like you just said, she's acting just like her mom or something like that. But the child again, sees that as derogatory negative and you're saying I'm bad. And that mm -hmm. part of me, that parent that I am made of is inherently bad. And it has, both that um, devastating effect, let's say on the social plane, because this is playing out in public and it's embarrassing, of course, um, but it's also deeply emotionally destructive because the takeaway uh, leaves the child um, at a loss about where to get care and where to get support and where to, to get um, help because there's a sense that if this is the parent who's authoritative or the one who has, let's say, custody. Uh, it's like, that is the judgment. So there's a judgmental element here that's not understood by the parent who might be doing this. Mm -hmm. And the child might also be taking on some of what the parent's saying. So like if the father's calling the mother crazy, even if it's in jest as a joke, it's still unhealthy. And the child might even, like I said, digest, well, maybe I'm crazy if mom's crazy or maybe go against the mother and, uh, and start to see the mother as crazy. So it's, oh, it's very I, dysfunctional. I, I, love, I love what you just said. I think that's great because I think it shows the chaos that it produces. So if mom's crazy, then I'm crazy. I'm going to act out crazy too, or I'm going to do crazy things. And I think this is one of the other takeaways about um, children of divorce, which often our society minimizes, and clearly parents who are dividing, who are divorcing often, I see them in therapy, of course, and they often minimize, well, it's not a big deal for my kids because half of their class is, you know, divorced parents. And that's the minimization. It's not at all true. I mean, yes, the, the kids may have divorced parents, but the damage is also very real. And we know that medically, and we know that emotionally, and we know that socially, and we know that vocationally. So it plays out. I mean, we even know just in the fact of divorce, that it affects metabolism, it affects your, your health uh, risk going forward in your later adult life. And we certainly know it in terms of anxiety and depression. And um, we certainly know it in terms of school grades performance. We certainly know it in terms of um, the impact often on kids who can either move 
very conservatively or very maybe liberally. And what I mean by that is they may be very repressed, unsure, insecure. They take a very safe way. They might be very focused and narrow in their worldview, or they might go to the other end and act out, uh, get involved in drugs. God only knows get involved in a lot more behaviors that are more dangerous. So almost all of the studies show a substantial deficit in terms of uh, emotional and physical and social damage and you know pro projection about success and mm -hmm. all of those factors seem uh, affected by children who endure or suffer divorce. Most definitely. Okay, number 11 is using kids to get your needs met is often a subtle process and not necessarily so different than parents who live vicariously through their children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is um, like, it's, it's just a bit natural for parents to, I mean, having children is probably one of the greatest blessings of life, of our life, uh, because you're involved in this unbelievable creative process of uh, another human being and you're a participant in, in that physical and emotional reality. So you do get to review your life in many ways through the child. So you will be quite naturally returning to, um, you know, little, you know, stories from childhood, the nursery rhymes and things that you didn't get the first time, or maybe books you didn't read. And that I would see as a natural kind of re-examination and maybe it's a very positive healthy thing that you could celebrate enjoy and participate in maybe it's sports maybe it's social things maybe it's the creativity of your child of things you never imagined that your child explores and you certainly want to celebrate so all of that is available to us in parenting but in this instance here uh, as you suggested it's this vicarious element which is a pejorative it's a negative thing where we're basically trying to live out our needs through that child. So if we felt we didn't drink, we might introduce alcohol or something like that. And it can be played out um, in ways which are not um, really sensitive to the child and to their basic developmental needs and to who they are as individuals. And I don't know that this is the place that I would want to introduce this, but it just came to me as we were thinking about you know, the good and the bad and so forth. I think for me, and I write about this in the book, uh, the, the necessity in terms of like the question you started out asking about, we want a, a point and a counterpoint to the elements that we're addressing, which are generally negative. Um, and where I want to go that, with that for a moment, if uh, that's okay, is to address spiritual issues sure. and religious issues. So spirituality and religion uh, has a bad rap often in our culture just because of the way these uh, things move at different times in culture but i would probably say uh, spirituality and some faith direction and guidance is often an incredible resource during these times of instability having a neutral identified good structure and of course you need to tune into what is spiritually soothing for your soul or do you believe is spiritually healthy for your children or your family but once that's identified, I think that can become a huge stabilizer for children who are feeling like their compass, their guides, their mom and dad have lost their compass. And there needs to be a restabilization of something that stands maybe higher, stronger, and is secure and that they can trust. And I think in that sense, um, it is very helpful for parents to nurture a spiritual and religious life that's authentic, not some kind of formalism. I don't think that necessarily does much for most. I mean, it, there's something to be taken from that, but something about like, what's good? Why is it good? What's right? What do we want to do? Because that can mm -hmm. often replace and help heal the scars and the pains that kids endure. Yes, most definitely. That's so good because a lot of times we think, oh, let's just get get people on medication or the healthcare has the solution or uh, another therapy session with the psychologist or psychiatrist. It's probably try other avenues. Don't limit yourself to just, well, you know, I, I love what you just said there. Mouth. Yeah. And I think it comes on really looking at what are, okay. So we have been hit by this list of maybe 
these negative pathological impacts that are, as we said, I gave you a list of effects that kids often suffer, whether it's emotional or physical. So yeah. in, in the parenting, you know, look, because this is like a takeoff on that spiritual religious piece, which is a salve, a help. And you had made a comment of not just moving to pills or another therapy session. I fully agree because it's not just looking at the damage and response to maybe pathology damage hurt, which of course is extremely valuable, but seeing positive resources, which I do believe the spirituality and religion provide. I believe athletics provide. I believe positive, healthy activities provide. So I think parents creating a list of those resources, which will kind of booster and, and power up uh, the situation, lift up the, the slack or the lack that this wave or this cloud has produced would be very beneficial. We can go to alienating. Most now. definitely. <laughs> okay, so last one, number 12 is alienating, which is a big one. Yes, yes. So it's the, the, it's the impact of the barrage, as it's written here, of negative information by the other parent. And I see this often, particularly in highly contested situations, function as a guardian ad litem in Massachusetts, which means kind of a support for court judges and so forth in helping to investigate these cases. But somehow someone learns or perceives they learn to play the legal game, which might be, you know, you create a uh, actions of accusations or create legal um, complaints, which may or may not have any relevance, but the more disturbing one is when they don't have any relevance. So you look for a way uh, as a strategy in your duress, in the divorce of um, identifying uh, legal violations, maybe making up stories of in a, improprieties that are sexual with one of the children or damaging or hurting the child and moving toward court actions, court orders, police orders to actually get evidence of negativity for uh, a definition of the other parent such that the child is left with being alienated. So we speak of alienation is alienation and that's a, a, a kind of a, a controversial subject in psychology is alienation a psychological um, situation or, or condition and I don't want to go into that topic in this instance but I think just addressing the emotional behavioral issue of alienation is quite real. So you really have framed a legal way of control of a situation. And now there is a bit of, um, well, it's brainwashing of a child in terms of a particular position so that the child begins to feel that the other parent is not good or does not identify with them or actually creates a wall that separates them from that other parent. And that, um, you know, if the child chooses to make those adult decisions in their life, for whatever reasons, we make decisions to be with people or not people, you know, be with people, that's one thing. But I think encouraging your child you know, in the best way you can to understand that parent makes sense. That doesn't mean putting them into the fire. If you feel the parent's alcoholic and drunk drinking in a car, I wouldn't certainly put my kid in that car, you know? So it's like, I, I'm not suggesting that. Clearly, if there's a danger and clear of danger, that's a matter. But we're speaking right. about a psychological process here of really creating a, a narrative, a story, which the child begins to uh, adopt and then believe and it actually creates a huge moat uh, such that the other parent has no access and you know to some extent that is one of the challenges you know in parenting generally like have we uh, functioned in ways which are going to create healthy bonds and establish you know healthy relationships for our children going forward i think that is a task of parenting generally it becomes a much more complex and challenging one given some of the dynamics we've referenced in this uh, discussion about um, divorce, things get much more mm -hmm. complex and much more challenging and require much stronger efforts to um, out for outreach and, and to gain connection. 
Yes. And I think it's just, you know, a good reminder that that child will only have one mom, will only have one dad in mm -hmm. their life. And as long as they're not abusive and you're not displacing mm -hmm. your own resentment, anger, bitterness uh, to the situation, you want them to have that relationship with their mom. You want them to have that relationship with their dad because alienating them and setting up, like you said, the brainwashing, and then you have adult estrangement all in, and then they miss out all on all those years, they could have had a relationship with that parent. And they may come back and be mad at you when they finally get a clearer head about it and for the alien. Correct. And I think that those are really very complicated questions and dynamics. Um, if I may, I have something about this attunement to the child uh, that I would like to add, if that's okay. And it's really coming directly sure. from the book. Um, so it's like the importance about how parents can listen to them, nurture them, engage them, and lead them. And I, and I wrote it with this kind of um, simple message that you want your, ch your child to walk away with. You want your child to really believe. Um, so if they were to say, I think mom does this, I think dad does this, these are the things I would want the child to fill in the blank. Um, so the parent saying, I see you, you are important and invaluable, and you know it. I love you and act in ways that show it. I recognize you, take time to give you the attention you deserve, and we celebrate it. I guide you to discover your true self that shapes your identity, your dignity, your direction, and you embrace it. I think these are empowering messages that you want your child to feel is your legacy, that you've given them fully of yourself to the best of your ability. You know, we're all in process. We're all growing just like the kids. But, um, but right. to, to this, this is about kind of managing this rather ominous hurdle. Wow, that, that's some really good uh, language that people can utilize and actually take today if they're going through this and communicate that to their child. So those are really excellent um, ways of articulating that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, a pleasure being with you. Um, so time. this, sure. oh yes, yes. And I just want to, one final thought about all of this, um, and then I'll have you do some final thoughts, is, you know, as kids, you are looking up to your parents. You are witnessing how they do their relationships, how they communicate, and you're learning firsthand in the home. And I would hope that you don't want your child to go through the same experience, their own divorce, multiple divorces, that you know you can break this cycle um, if you, hopefully you're the last cycle to have it with them. And that, so that, like you said, the legacy that you're giving your child is a healthier start and hopefully not repeating the same mistakes you're making. Well said. And I think uh, what we are speaking about is often this rather elusive concept of a demonstrative love. I mean, you know, one enters a marriage with a sense that we're going to divorce, you enter with a sense of love. But I think the, the challenge here that we're moving in on as we move into this nitty gritty detail is that Love requires a lot more clarity, definition, and it's, it's complex. And uh, it's worthy of um, a much deeper uh, clarity around what does it mean to really sacrifice for another person, to love another person, and to give oneself to another person. And if that's the message that you want to impart to your child. Yes, whether you're married or whether you're divorced, stay on that message, that's really good. Okay. Yes. Well, thank you, Dr. Churban. I really do appreciate you coming on my channel and sharing your wisdom in this area. I know you've done a lot of work and I hope people will pick up your book. Um, I, I think they'll find it very helpful um, during these like difficult times. Thank you. Pleasure to be with you. Yes. And if you guys like this video, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to share and subscribe and also comment down below. Uh, We'd love to hear your feedback. And um, if you haven't already subscribed, please subscribe and hit the bell to be alerted to when the next video drops. Thanks for watching.